Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this CPD webinar on this Thursday evening. My name is Domini, and I'm the facilitator this evening. And um, before I hand over to Mike Davies, I just want to run through a few slides with you just to go through some general facts before we get started. So just to run through, uh, nobody can see you or hear you, so if you're in your pyjamas, then don't worry about it. And um, the presenter will answer questions as, as we go through, as once we get to the end, we'll run through the questions and, uh, and we'll go through some answers there. Once we come to the end, um, you will then get a certificate and uh, a video link will drop into you if you're a CPD ME member within the next 24 hours. And uh, you'll be able to access the recording from it as well, uh, which is always dead handy, uh, just to refresh and, and look over things over time. If you're not familiar with CPDME, uh, CPDME is an online website and mobile application. So it does allow you to build uh, and record and maintain your CPD as you go along. So it makes life a heck of a lot easier. And um, it's, it allows you sort of to maintain an accurate record uh, and uh, sort of drop in your electronic certificates as you're going through. So you don't have to mess around with having to collate all of your files um, sort of hanging around under, under shelves and um, sort of propping things up as we go along. So I encourage you to have a look at that if you uh, are not familiar with CPDME. The other thing to note as well is that we do have a Twitter handle, CPDME, so what we do do is uh, we keep up to date with uh, ongoing courses and, and developments so that you can remain up to, up to date with your clinical practice. So we encourage you to follow that if you're not already doing so and specifically for this evening if you want to follow CPDMEEL and sort of post your questions on there for Mike uh, before it gets started. So I'm sure Mike will introduce that once I've handed over to him. So without further ado, um, Mike, are you there? I'm here, yeah. Super. So I'm going to hand over to Mike now, who's going to go through e-learning, the challenges of new technologies. Right, there we go. Okay, so this is uh, called e-learning, making the most of new technologies, something that I didn't make a very good job of at the uh, opening few um, sentences uh, of this evening's talk. Uh, um, as it says here, my name is Mike Davis. I've done a number of uh, previous um, seminars, webinars, and uh, I hope uh, that this is going to be a useful addition to the ones that um, uh, we've done so far. I am really quite keen, particularly given the subject matter, for you to be communicating um, with me uh, either immediately afterwards or possibly even during. And what I'm suggesting is that we use um, uh, the uh, either my uh, Twitter handle, which is at Mike Davis 8702, or um, the hashtag CPDMEEL. If you lose the uh, the the latter half of that, I um, I didn't get round to changing that. Um, but CPDMEEL uh, may address any of the issues that uh, you might want to raise during the course of the session. If we do get any substantial numbers of uh, of tweets, and I sincerely hope that we do. What I will do subsequently is, uh, is use a piece of software called Storyfy, and that will allow us to um, summarize the content of the discussion as it unfolds. Uh, down at the bottom of the screen there is my email address, uh, and I'm quite happy to, uh, to discuss issues that arise during the course of the discussion um, uh, at a, at a, a, a post the event this evening. Um, the image that you see on the screen is where I'm from. Uh, it's not Paris on a rainy day, it's Blackpool on a, a typical August day, as it seems to have been over the last few weeks or so. Uh, I'm uh, just down the road from uh, where CPD uh, is headquarters, uh, and uh, I'm, um, uh, at the present time anyway, indoors, so I'm safe out of the rain. Essentially, I want to start us off by seeing whether we can address the issue of online learning uh, experientially. So I'm going to invite you to either email me or tweet a response to um, the question on the left hand side in relation to Twitter. So the questions are, I have a Twitter I, the statement I'm inviting you to make is any of the five statements on the left hand side, or sorry, any of the first four statements on the left hand side of the screen. Um, and uh, either to add in Twitter is a waste of time and effort or not, uh, depending on your attitude towards uh, Twitter. Um, perhaps we'll discuss that uh, as, as and when any uh, responses to my request actually arrive on screen during the course of the session. Um, as probably many of you know, uh, Twitter is a, an incredibly powerful platform with an amazing capacity to address literally millions of people. 
uh, as you can see from the recent tweet from um, the President of the United States, uh, dated 23rd of August, uh, talking about his experience of uh, addressing a meeting in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, generated uh, 25,000 retweets and 86,000 likes in a relatively short space of time. And uh, what I think uh, is a, an interesting, amusing response to that, because one of the consequences of electronic media is uh, it does have the capacity to enable interaction that almost certainly isn't in the control uh, or in the total control of the uh, initiators. And I think that uh, the example that you see on the screen as an example is a, is a particular example of that situation. So what are we planning to do? Uh, well, hopefully during the course of the session, what I'd like us to do is to explore a range of learning opportunities presented online, um, particularly drawing attention to virtual learning environments, which are increasingly widespread uh, in a variety of contexts, webinars like this one, things called reusable learning objects, which are components really of what I've already described. And uh, as I've already indicated, Twitter, podcast, YouTube, and the whole range of other uh, capacity, uh, uh, other communication tools um, that exist. As you can see from the image on the screen, um, it's one of those uh, somewhat marmite uh, situations. There are some people who are real enthusiasts for e-learning uh, and uh, the uh, new technologies, and there are other people who uh, can be quite antagonized by them. And there are also enthusiasts who can be quite antagonized by them. And I've got to say, I was one of those earlier on this evening when I was trying to get my computer to work and do what I wanted it to do. So how did we get here um, in terms of computing? Well, here's a, a photograph of a relatively early uh, computer. Um, it would probably uh, fill um, the house that I'm currently sitting in. Um, and uh, as you can see, it doesn't look very interesting. Uh, it doesn't look potentially very interactive. Um, and uh, of course, it wasn't particularly powerful. And I think the most noticeable thing about this is that there isn't any opportunity within that particular model for very much interaction. Um, and uh, we'll be coming back to that as a recurring theme throughout the, uh, the duration of the talk this evening. So where did we go from there? Um, well, they got smaller and they started to have the capacity to communicate with the human operators. So what we have here are still the ranges of cabinets up and down rooms, um, but there is now um, a screen and there is now keyboards. And you'll notice on the left-hand side of that image to the left of the, uh, the, the desk, there are um, some devices that look as if they have the capacity to uh, take other forms of communication. In fact, the earliest type of um, of computing equipment uh, I made use of um, quite early on uh, as a young man um, was uh, working in data processing was a thing called the, the Hollerith card which was a piece of cardboard uh, as big as an envelope uh, and in that card there were punched holes there were codings of other forms of representation of data and there were machines that were capable of sorting those cards and allowing you to manage that data as a consequence of that. We're moving on then to, uh, to even more sophisticated systems with even more capacity for interaction. And the, the screen uh, shot now is the first computer that I ever worked with uh, in a, a, an educational capacity. And these computers, the PET computer, uh, was um, put into schools, which is the sector I worked in at the time. Uh, every school in the country got 30 of these machines. And invariably, they ended up in the maths departments usually to the absolute terror of maths teachers who have absolutely no idea what to do with them. The interesting thing about these is that you can see that there is a keyboard with an alphanumeric pad, uh, but there's also a device that uh, implied the potential for, um, for uh, recording uh, in one direction or another. And this was developed a little bit further down the line with this particular machine here, the BBC uh, computer it was called. Um, and that had the first use of uh, floppy disks. And uh, some of you may be old enough to remember a floppy disk that looked a little bit like um, uh, a silver, a little silver 45 uh, vinyl record. And it slotted into there and uh, ran a variety of programs, um, some of which were, you know, amazingly powerful given the limitations on memory size. 
And we go on to slightly more clunky, uh, but nevertheless still increasingly portable machines, to things that are beginning to look like what we have now. And increasingly um, small portable uh, devices that might lead us into a situation where in fact we are in a situation where we can have this type of technology and we may well be moving into a situation where we have that type of technology uh, and the capacity for people to have chips or whatever inserted is an interesting challenge that I think the virtual learning and, uh, communities are going to have to address in the not too distant future. Okay, so my interest obviously is around learning and I want you to think for a moment what we mean by learning. What sort of things do we have in mind when we talk about learning? And how the other question we can ask ourselves is how can we make use of new technology to make learning a little bit um, more easy, more um, comfortable or whatever. And in terms of a definition of learning, uh, I came across one that I think is quite helpful and it goes like this. In the process of acquiring knowledge, skills, attitudes and values through study, experience or teaching that causes a change of behaviour that is persistent, measurable and specified or allows an individual to formulate a new mental construct or revise a prior mental construct. So quite a lot going on in that particular definition but among the things that it includes is the acquisition of knowledge, the um, confrontation of that knowledge perhaps with prior knowledge and experience and uh, a key ingredient possibly being notions of change in behavior or change in understanding and I think that we also need to acknowledge among the other characteristics of that is that we need to recognize it as being something that is um, fun uh, hopefully and hopefully that uh, e-learning has the capacity to enable that to a greater or lesser extent. You may have disagreement about that and perhaps we'll hear a bit, little bit about that later on. Okay. So in terms of the most modern type of equipment, we have an amazing capacity that has emerged in, in recent times and uh, we're now in a situation where a lot of things that were at one time presented to audiences in um, a lecture theatre or in a classroom or in a, a language laboratory or whatever can be managed in a whole variety of, uh, of locations using a wide variety of technologies. So um, the uh, organization that I do quite a lot of work with, the Advanced Life Support Group and Resuscitation Council, um, <coughs> developed a virtual learning uh, element of its uh, generic instructors course a, a number of years ago and uh, it now has the capacity to be uh, used on a, everything from uh, a desktop computer in a computer lab or in your home to a, a mobile phone on your daily commute. And we're looking at all uh, uh, additional ways in which we can make that portability um, uh, much more uh, available. So the use of things like the podcast, uh, for example, is something that emerged recently as a, a very strong recommendation from quite a number of users. So it has huge capacity and in the process of thinking this through, this is the sort of uh, issues that I thought were uh, relatively important in terms of the VLE. That it's a set of teaching and learning tools, uh, making use of uh, computers, um, but also the capacity of the internet, which is increasingly strong, <coughs> that uses sophisticated VLE software platforms uh, based on servers, uh, in a variety of places um, and can be accessed uh, from a variety of places, everything from the library, the home, the internet cafe, the pub, wherever it happens to be, as long as you have uh, an internet or um, 4G type connection. So it has the capacity to be uh, obtained, gain access to, um, from virtually anywhere you want. Uh, literally there are no restrictions um, on, uh, on access unless they're imposed by, um, for example, um, governments who don't want people to see certain sorts of things. But essentially, um, you don't have to be in the lecture theatre at nine o'clock. Um, you could be um, sitting on a, a bus or um, up at three o'clock in the morning in your, um, in your home 
uh, reading things uh, that were presented uh, in a face-to-face -face environment at a different time and place. And we'll, be, we'll be coming back to that analysis in a little while. Okay, um, in terms of what a VLE topic looks like from the inside out, so to speak, uh, a number of uh, years ago I came up with this uh, as a, a mind map of what the ideal TV, uh, VLE topic would look like. <laughs> and you'll notice on the um, the right the left hand side, sorry, at the very top, you've got technical issues, and of course they are key uh, ingredients in the whole process. Um, uh, so behind the notion of uh, frequently asked questions and help desks, there's a whole technological infrastructure that uh, isn't even of the responsibility of uh, the educational designers. In terms of design features, you need to pay attention to things like what the fonts look like, what color looks like, and so on. You need to think about the nature of interaction, a theme that I'm going to be returning to um, later on. And you can see from that particular strand of this mind map that interaction is um, multifaceted and quite complex. And down at the bottom, you can see um, the nature of the process that perhaps you have to go through to um, get a uh, a uh, product from initiation to presentation uh, on people's computers. On the right hand side you need to think about more educationally driven phenomena like the need for a, a careful structure. You need possibly to give people uh, access to uh, information about how they need to think about their studying responsibilities. Um, you then need to think about the content of the material and we'll be talking a little bit more about that later. But again, you can see that there's an awful lot of stuff going on there. Everything from the style of language to, that you use to the, the amount of text, the use of images, the links to other websites, the use of sound, etc. cetera. Um, and finally, the notion of social presence. And uh, that's a, a particularly key ingredient in uh, environments like the one that we are sitting in at the present time. Um, the whole notion of the webinar uh, has um, in some respects taken us back a few years because uh, whereas the modern lecture theatre now is often a fairly interactive environment, actually generating interaction in this environment is often quite complex um, and I think we've already experienced that so far this evening. <coughs> Here are a couple of examples of the sort of screens that you can create in a virtual learning environment. So you've got a combination of text in various forms um, where uh, the italic text there, text there is, is indicating a quotation, the image um, supplementing the ideas uh, that are represented in the text. And uh, on this next slide here, the sort of interaction, um, it's a, 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 an activity uh, developed uh, a number of years ago to encourage particular close reading of text and this is something that invites people to complete, uh, to find words that allow um, meaningful uh, completion of um, sentences and paragraphs. So this is a way of encouraging engagement with um, the learners uh, in ways that perhaps um, the conventional series of images on a screen might not otherwise do so. One of the big anxieties about um, online learning, I think, is the notion of it being um, somewhat um, limited in terms of the nature of the interaction capacity uh, that is available. Obviously you can include images, these are just images that I've um, have found on, on the internet and I think this is an interesting example. Any of you who stood in front of a, um, <coughs> a contemporary lecture theatre will be faced by the back of an awful lot of computer screens and you have absolutely no idea what's going on um, behind those um, those screens, uh, quite literally everything from people doing their email to watching video presentations or whatever, and that's uh, you know in, a, in some respects it's a challenge to the organisational capacity that we have uh, when we're using new technology. There's always the stress associated with making the whole system work, and um, computers are amazingly powerful tools, and we have very high expectations of them but they don't always necessarily meet. Um, so there is the potential for quite uh, high levels of frustration. And one of the strongest critiques that were made about um, uh, in our recent evaluation of the uh, instructors course that I described earlier 
was uh, the difficulty sometimes in, for example, downloading video images uh, and so on, that they took time. Um, and when you push people to say, what do you mean by how, uh, by taking time, uh, you might discover that what it meant was that it took maybe 40 seconds or so to, to download. Um, and in some respects, that's not a lot of time, but it feels as if it is when you're the person sitting there waiting for it, watching a little disc spin around. There is an amazing capacity to, um, to get content from um, the internet. And uh, if you talk to GPs nowadays, you will find that almost invariably the typical patient will arrive with a vague idea of what's going on for them because they've already been talking to Dr. Google about what might be happening. So there are issues around the extent to which people have access to information. Um, and as we'll be exploring uh, briefly in a moment or so, we are not altogether sure what the nature of that uh, information might be. So just some more uh, potential images that we could actually view and um, something here. There is a, a description, I'm sorry about this, a description of a, a reusable learning object. And a reusable learning object is a, is a particular piece of educational information that can be used by a variety of organizations. And the sample that I'm going to show you here, which uh, is something that I can go to, I hope anyway, I hope you can all see this uh, as it comes up on my screen is a, a reusable learning object from um, the University of Nottingham Medical School. Donny, is this something that you can all see? Yeah, we can all see it fine, yeah. Great, okay. So this is a sort of uh, piece of um, information with a variety of activities and videos built in, and it's got a capacity to, uh, as you can see, be interactive on the screen. And this has got the, um, the ability to um, enable uh, people to explore topics, but from a variety of perspectives. So this particular reusable learning object might be used by um, undergraduate medical students, or it might be used in other settings, um, postgraduate courses, uh, or whatever. So it has the capacity to have multiple potential users, um, because people can access it from, uh, as I've done this evening, just by clicking on a um, uh, 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 a URL. And here's another example of that. We're talking about the amazing capacity of something like this, which is a description of online facilitation. And I can download this website um, onto my computer. And everywhere where I see something highlighted in blue, I can click on that and I can gain access. Well, not in this case, that particular one. You can tell I didn't plan that particular one. But there's a whole range of things here that I can actually get onto or by just clicking on the, um, the screen. Okay. <clears throat> so that is uh, just a demonstration of the sort of capacity that we have within any sort of learning environment to provide people with access to all sorts of other materials in addition to the ones that you've created. Unfortunately, there is an amazing capacity for um, uh, incorrect information to be presented as well. And among the characteristics that learners need to develop uh, in using VLEs is, uh, is something that, rec has the, that, has, that gives them the capacity to recognize things uh, that are blatantly inaccurate, as we have with this image here of somebody not in Blackpool, but thinking that they were with the Statue of Liberty. Um, uh, and that's an obvious example of uh, a false claim, but less obvious examples of false claims are a considerable greater challenge, I think, for the community when they're possibly using um, uh, uncertain sources um, to uh, get access to their information. In terms of the way in which we can think about the, uh, the um, virtual learning environments of various sorts, uh, I think among the ways in which we can think about these is across this two by two matrix of same times, different times, same place, different place. And obviously, if you're in the same time and the same place, there's absolutely nothing to stop you from gathering around a table and having a face to face conversation. And I think that we mustn't ignore the fact that this is still a very, very powerful way of engaging with subject matter. 
you can have um, uh, a same time, different place type interaction, and that's in fact what we're engaging in at the moment. Uh, I'm talking uh, to you, you're uh, in a variety of places around the, uh, the country, and you have, in fact, you could be anywhere in the world, and we have had uh, people visiting from as far afield as South uh, uh, America on one occasion. <clears throat> and that's, this has got huge advantages in terms of its capacity to engage people interactively uh, at the same time. Um, but we have absolutely no idea what the nature of the experience is. And uh, I have no idea what um, you guys uh, out there are doing. So I'm sitting here talking um, to you, and you might be doing any one of the things that you see on this particular screen here including watching Simpson on another computer. In terms of different time, but same place or different place, you've got the nature of asynchronous activity. And um, for the same place asynchronous activity, it might be something as basic as sharing Google Docs. <coughs> and I'm currently working on the final report of our evaluation, for example, and my colleague and I uh, have shared access to a document that we can both um, uh, amend, alter, adapt add to, uh, etc., uh, or use as a uh, discussion environment to allow us to continue our our interaction. Or our, uh, and that could be done simultaneously, or we could do it uh, asynchronously. So uh, I could be in uh, my uh, place of work in the morning working on it, and he might be picking up the, uh, the interactions that I engaged in uh, later on during the course of the day. And that would be recorded in a variety of ways. We can also communicate um, uh, with much larger pieces of, uh, of information through um, pieces of software like Dropbox or other sort of iCloud type interactions. And you can see from here that we've got the potential within this synchronous model of sender-receiver sharing data um, at, uh, at the same time, um, although I've got to say the model that we're uh, exploring uh, as we speak here is that the data tends to go in one direction only. Or we have the asynchronous model where at the center of that interaction you've got something that says stop. And that stop is the pause that allows the person at the other end to frame their uh, response without having that sort of sense of immediacy that you have when you're in the same um, uh, physical space and time zone. So the two models are uh, have um, significant potential for engaging people in different ways. Here's an example of the sort of thing that perhaps might go on in a, a sort of chat space, and there are a whole range of these different sorts of chat spaces. They're widely used in, in a variety of educational settings, so that people in uh, both real time and, uh, and pause time uh, uh, actually ask questions, pose issues, and so on. <clears throat> uh, technologies like Twitter are often used uh, um, to uh, explore issues um, in synchronous time, and uh, there are a number of organizations that run sort of online interactive seminar um, systems uh, during the course of the, uh, uh, of the week, and you just watch out for them, you join in, and you indicate your engagement and you, and you make your contributions by using a hashtag type statement. As you can see here in this particular case, sorry, uh, where it says uh, ED web chat. So all you need to do is to indicate that and anybody who is logged into that particular hashtag will be able to engage in the discussion. Um, this is the sort of response that you might have more asynchronously where somebody, in this case, this person here, um, poses a, a, an issue. Obviously, it's Twitter. Obviously, it's, list, it's limited to 140 characters, but people have got the capacity to engage with that and increasingly make use of the capacity to um, provide links to other resources. So among the things that I find particularly valuable um, for, uh, for Twitter is just access to very, very good and interesting um, articles, papers, and so on, and so on, and so on. So it's a very good way of doing things. So in some respects, our target performance is the sort of capacity that's demonstrated by this sort of environment here. The fact that face-to-face, -face, you have an amazing capacity to do all sorts of things. But it has its limitations. It doesn't allow for 
uh, intensive periods of private study or reflection or research or um, setting up and running activities that you need to report the group back to. And this is where the strength of the, um, the virtual learning can begin to emerge when you're engaging in group activity over periods of time, making use of all of the asynchronous capacities that exist within the various domains. In terms of thinking then about where we're up to with this sort of material, here's a, 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 a quick diversion into a, a, a SWOT analysis. In terms of the strengths and opportunities, you've got um, the potential for almost instant access. Um, and I would say instant access for most of the time, apart from those times when you really want to get online and for some reason or another you can't to a recognition of almost limitless possibilities in terms of access to information, ideas, and so on, and so on. Um, then we have on the uh, weaknesses side, there is the potential perhaps for there to be um, too much information, that if you uh, read a, a, a modern um, research article, you'll find that among the things that people have to do is to put serious limitations on the way in which they seek um, previous explorations of their subject matter. Um, you know, so they go on to something like PubMed or Medline or something of that nature and start off with one um, frame of reference to allow uh, for um, a potential exploration of a subject matter and they come up with literally thousands of possible articles that are relevant to it. So they narrow the search term down until they've got um, and keep doing that until they've got uh, a, a sufficiently handleable uh, amount of material. When I was doing my research for my PhD, I actually went into a physical library and physically moved books and paper around. So there was a different sort of limitation that applied at that time. I wasn't aware necessarily of what I didn't know, whereas nowadays you can be aware of what you're choosing not to engage with. Uh, but the too much information is potentially an issue. And I think that here we also got to acknowledge the fact there is the potential for misleading or inaccurate information. And the development of a, 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 an extremely efficient crack detector is a, an extremely valuable uh, ingredient in this process that we've got to look very critically at the sort of information that we see uh, or hear through virtual learning because of its potential capacity to be misleading, inaccurate, partial, or whatever. So if we think about what these, um, the advantages are that enable some progress to be made using these sorts of technologies, we might be able to think of it as being a just-in-time learning mechanism. Um, it, you can, can, people can gain access, access to it at any time. It theoretically has the capacity to save time. This was very much of an inducement for um, uh, early engagement with it before people realized it was a little more problematic than that. In terms of saving money, similarly, it was a challenge. The notion of it being enabling communities separated by time and space, I think is possibly the most exciting bit of it all, but I think possibly the biggest challenge that we face in um, coming to terms with how we can make the most effective use of uh, of e-learning opportunities and, uh, and technologies, the technologies that enable that. <coughs> I first became involved in uh, e-learning in the mid-1990s, and by um, 2000, uh, I'd been engaged in a process of uh, enabling postgraduate studies um, across three continents. I was working with colleagues from the United States and Australia in developing uh, learning opportunities um, in their postgraduate work to allow for a, a, an extremely varied range of experiences. And we came up with this model to describe some of the challenges associated with, um, with online learning. So on the right hand side you can see over here we have a conceptual key that talked about um, social organization and the expectations that people had of the online learning environment being social. A general orientation towards learning, whether people were mo well motivated or only motivated by um, the demand for or the desire for um, a qualification, or perhaps because they had to do something, you know, you think mandatory learning type environments. 
orientation towards the task and the tutor engaged in that was um, often a, a highly politicized uh, um, phenomenon um, in terms of the way in which people felt towards uh, authority, etc. In terms of the way in which the emerging group work started to function was an, the next ingredient and that was supported by an emotional climate in terms of people's response to a variety of things like challenge and so on, which is the final category. And essentially we came up with this four by this two by two typology. So down at the bottom left when there was poor learning dynamics and poor group dynamics, you have something that we call fragmented by technologies. When you had high learning dynamics but low group dynamics, the I'm okay, you're okay notion sort of characterized by the highly independent learner who was unwilling and unable perhaps to share their material. Then there were groups that we came across that we described as the summer holidays and these were the ones that spent an awful lot of time talking about their, their social needs being met by being online and having the capacity to talk to people from uh, in Australia etc. And the ones that we thought were the ones that were most effective in managing their experience of uh, the online learning environment engaged in something that we call tough love and what these people did was acknowledge the fact that they had a responsibility to the community that they were they saw themselves predominantly as collaborative in nature that they had a, a little bit of, a, of an addiction towards um, the experience and uh, uh, people actually sort of talked about the fact that uh, sometimes they found the experience incredibly uh, powerful um, people talking about logging on at all times of day or night. Uh, one person described the fact that they were on holiday in Florida but took their laptop with them to the beach and spent all of their time going on uh, to the system. So that notion of addiction to the process becoming quite a characteristic feature. That they engaged in work, um, which is a slightly psychodynamic interpretation of the way, way groups functioned, but their focus was while they were interested and supportive of group interaction, their prime consideration was the nature of work. That there was a degree of anxiety associated with um, with uh, the uh, the whole experience because you were feeling challenged and you didn't have the full capacity to test out the support mechanisms that might exist. And almost as a direct co uh, uh, response to that was the idea of of taking risks. And that was a very, very strong feature of the groups who um, were functioning very powerfully across thousands of miles and um, uh, 24 um, or whatever it is, time zones. So the challenge of enabling communities separated by time and space we think is a very complex one. And we try to sum it up in this, this two-dimensional uh, matrix here. And it probably needs multiple dimensions to adequately describe the complexities that are going on in that particular environment. Part of the uh, the argument that we made uh, at this time was this quotation here, and I'll just give you a few seconds or so to read that. And I think what this is trying to say, and um, in some respects its meaning is a little bit elusive but I think what it's really getting at is that our attempts to define uh, e-learning opportunities in the terms that we currently describe other learning environments uh, is to some extent flawed and that what we need to be willing to engage in is uh, a future when possibly we're thinking quite differently about the nature of the learning experience. Um, so part of the challenge I think for people who like yourselves are interested in this is looking slightly over the horizon uh, into the future to see whether it's possible to abandon notions for example like the webinar and think of a different model that would allow for considerably more interaction than what we've received so far. The final two challenges I want to describe are summed up in two neat little cartoons. The first here from Kathy an American cartoon and it is a, a little bit of a challenge for working out quite how you do interact with one another and how in a very uh, two-dimensional 
uh, environment, like the, the, the forum, the text message, or whatever, it's very, very difficult sometimes to, to have subtle uh, meanings and nuances, uh, because all you have are the words that people see on the screen, and you don't quite know what they mean. And then finally, this one, I think is a classic cartoon, in cyberspace, nobody knows that you're a dog, um, and that is, of course, quite a, a, an interesting interpretation of the way in which people might at one time have thought of misrepresenting themselves. So that's more or less me coming to the end of, um, of uh, this um, session, uh, and I'm willing at this point to take any questions, either verbally or in written form. So if I can hand back to you briefly, Dominic. Yeah, no problem. So if anybody's got any questions, if you have a look at the side, there's an option for you to type in a question. Um, so if anybody has anything, then then feel free to to write away. We'll just give it a few moments, Mike, for, for people to yeah, ask sure. some questions. Yeah. I think it's interesting that we haven't had um, many tweets, in fact, any tweets from outside of um, the CPD me office. Uh, so I think that this actually highlights some of the challenges that I think I've been hoping to identify. The fact that it is a slightly difficult situation that we're putting people in to be interactive in an environment that feels very much one directional. Definitely, Mike. I'm not, I think if we can encourage people to to get onto Twitter as well, because um, as you said, there's not many people uh, asking any questions via that means. So it might be. Um, I mean, if there's no questions coming up at the minute, which there aren't any so far um, on on here, maybe uh, we could take that offline, Mike, and um, and look at the questions that we can do following the uh, session. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to respond uh, subsequently to the session, um, either by Twitter or email, and um, hopefully we will uh, get a little bit further down the line. Perfect. Um, well, I've not seen any more questions come in, but if you have any questions as I'm just uh, sort of closing off, Mike, that was extremely interesting, um, and a very interesting uh, session you've just given there. Um, certainly food for thought for, for what I do in the in, uh, project management as well. Oh, Mike, we've just got a question that, that comes through, it's come through. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's something that Elizabeth Gormley has said, thanks, I find Twitter hard to use, and it's difficult to use for both webinar and, and Twitter. So I think she, I think there's, it's just expressing the difficulties of using two means of, uh, of communication, really. Yeah, I think that's, I, I fully identify with that. And uh, the first time I actually, um, <coughs> Excuse me. The first time I engaged in a webinar, I did actually uh, uh, manage to generate a certain amount of Twitter enthusiasm, and I found it actually quite confusing trying to manage both environments simultaneously. So I lost my place, pressed the wrong buttons on a, you know, more than I managed to do this evening. So it is, it is difficult. Okay, so I think we're probably at this point coming to an end. Uh, I, I think part, either. Um, uh, people have dropped off or they have recognized the challenge that we've already identified by the distance that is created by virtue of the environment that we're working within. I'd welcome comments subsequently to the session. If there are any sort of further questions then, then feel free to go ahead on on Twitter just to sort of close off and thank you again Mike. Um, okay. As I've said before it was, it's been extremely interesting. Um, for, for me, really, um, because I think it's uh, it's something that's sort of relevant to what I do as well, as well as this. So uh, yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Um, so just to just to sort of share my screen with you guys, just to sort of uh, run through some final bits and pieces. I apologise, I'm having difficulty sharing my screen with you guys, but just to sort of close things off. Um, you will, as I've mentioned before, the CPD certificate will drop into your, your sort of profile as well after the event. 
Um, so if uh, you are a CPD member, that then that will be automatic. Um, also, um, just to sort of raise your awareness, if you can go to the CPD Me website, you'll be able to see upcoming webinars as well. So we've got a couple in September, which you may be interested in. Um, one on clinical leadership with within an NHS ambulance service trust, which is presented by Dan Smith, and that's on the sixth of September. And we also have another webinar coming up on the 13th of September, which is around leading with a coaching style. And that's presented by Becky Martin, who's from Boo Coaching and Consulting. Um, there will be more webinars coming up for the next, uh, next few months, so keep your eye on, on the CPDME website, where we'll share more up-and-coming events. And um, just sort of finally to, to close off, again, Mike, thank you so much for tonight. Um, it's been excellent and very, very interesting. Um, I'm sure everyone, if, if the, the mics were on, would, would thank you as well. So just want to say good night to everybody, uh, a good evening, and um, thank you very much for joining us on this Thursday. Thanks, everybody.
You're very welcome. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you very much to my colleague in the background, Sarah Harris. You're very welcome, Andrew. And for those people who are going back to work, please stay safe. For those people who are at home and relaxing, go and pour yourself a nice cup of tea, relax, and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks, and good night.